Hello everyone, my name is Evo and welcome to Cooking with the Koyas. And as you can see, I'm in my scrubbies. I don't have my kitchen apparel because today folks, we are not cooking. We are going to be making wine. The old fashioned, traditional Italian way, the way I grew up making wine and I still make wine today. We're gonna to make it right from scratch right from the grape onward. So by the time you watch this video, you will be a master at making homemade wine that tastes great. And for those of you who might want to make wine starting from juice, you can pick up at that point from the video and still follow the same procedure. At the end of the day, we're going to make some great wine. So glad you could join me in my scrubbies today. Stay tuned, folks. Okay, so here we are at Satellite Garden Center. La Pergola Grape Juice in Hamilton. That's where I always get my grapes. So the first thing we have to do, folks, is get our grapes. Look what I've picked out today. I've got five cases of Cab Franc, five cases of Shiraz, five cases of Sangiovese, five cases of Ruby Cabernet, and five cases of Cabernet Sauvignon. Now, the first thing we have to do with the grapes, I always taste them. They're really, really sweet. They're from California. First thing we have to do is basically de-stem them. So we have to take all the grapes off the stem. And honestly, folks, I used to do this by hand back in the day. But now I have a crusher de-stemmer because you want to take these, take the grapes off the stem, and then you want to crush the grapes. So right here, they have a crusher de-stemmer. They automatically do it. They're going to do it for me. So step number one, pick out the grapes. Step number two, remove the stems and then get them crushed at the same time. We're gonna do that right now. So this is where they're gonna dump the grapes into this hopper and they're gonna get crushed through here and the crushed grapes are gonna come through this hose right here and the stems, the stems folks, are gonna come out the other side right here. So what I'm gonna have is just grape must on the other side. So I made my selection, but as you can see here, they have lots of grapes and lots of variety. And this is a refrigerated room, folks, which means that the grapes are kept in good condition and I'm not concerned about any mold or anything like that. So I know my grapes are gonna be off to a great start and I'm really, really happy with the varieties I've selected today. So we're back. Wasn't that great picking out those grapes? All right, so now I would like to explain a little bit about the procedure and the destemming and why we've done that. So first of all, we are going to let these grapes, the skins and all those juices ferment in a container. So I have a friend of mine, he put his in this, these are his two containers. I'm going to put mine in that big vat in the back behind us there. So you put those grapes that have been destemmed into a container. Here's the thing, if you let them ferment now for let's say one to two days, you're gonna have a light red wine. Three to four days, medium dark. Five to six or seven days, a week or so, you're gonna get a darker wine. Because what happens folks is the longer the wine, the longer the grapes sit on the skins, the more color it extracts, the more tannins it gets, and you get that darker color. So having said that, for those of you who do not want a dark wine, we could take these right now and just dump them into a press like this and press our grapes right away. So basically in that process, you're basically uh, crushing and pressing right away. And if you do that, you'll end up with a lighter colored wine. For example, folks, Let's take Zinfandel. 
You've seen white Zinfandel and there's also red Zinfandel. It's the same grape. So what they do is they take the Zinfandel grape, they crush it, and then they press it right away because it's a red grape, but it has white juice. So when you crush it and press it right away, you're going to get white wine. If you crush it and let it sit in the container and extract the color from the skins, you're going to get a red wine. So that's how you go from white to red or even rosé. It's all about that skin contact. So having said that, now that we know what we're going to do, I'm going to let mine sit and ferment and we're going to let them stay for at least a week. So because I want a nice full bodied dark red wine. Now I mentioned that we used to de-stem by hand. We used to have a great time, folks. We'd sit around with a bunch of friends, get all those grapes, start de-stemming. Yeah, and that have a bite to eat, have a glass of wine. It's a big social, play some music. And then I would put it in the old hand, the old grinder. I'd take those de-stemmed grapes, put them in this, and then, and then grind them and let them fall into a drum. So if you have a place that will de-stem, and, and crush for you, great, take advantage of it. I have a fantastic place there in Hamilton at Satellite Gardens, uh, and if you have one, by all means, use it. Otherwise, have some fun, de-stem by hand. All you need is a crusher to crush the grapes. No, you don't need to put it in the vat and make the old days and take your socks off and start pounding. Uh, get, a, get a crusher and uh, crush your grapes, have it go in the vat, that's step number one. So. Um, if you wanted to make white wine, basically same thing. Take your grapes. If you're going to crush and press right away, you don't necessarily have to remove the stems. If you're going to press right away, I still like to. So take your white grapes, have them crushed, press them right away and start the process going that way. So, but today folks, we're going to focus on red. Let me get these into my vat and I'll show you the next step. So this container has been cleaned and sanitized. It's ready to take my grapes. And as you can see what they did at Satellite Gardens, they used plastic bags in the pails, which keeps everything very, very clean. So I basically going to one at a time now, take these, look at this beautiful grape muscle. And yes, it does splash. And that's why you need to wear some clothing that you don't mind getting uh, splashed with some grape juice. There we go. Okay, so I'm going to continue dumping all of those into my container, which won't take me too long. Then we're going to add our yeast and I'm going to talk a little bit about that as well. Okay, as I'm putting my grapes in my vat, which is a beautiful thing. I just want to show you my friend's drum because chances are you're going to have a drum when you make your wine. I, I, I don't think you're going to have a vat that big, but you never know. But anyhow, this is the drum. You can see his beautiful crushed grapes and juice are sitting in there. And we're just putting the top on it to keep the fruit flies out. But the top is loose because there's going to be fermentation gas coming out. So you don't want a tight seal. You just want a very, very loose seal. In fact, on my vat, I'm just going to put a sheet over it. Anyhow, I just wanted to show you that. So there we have it folks. The tub is now filled and you'll notice there's some room here. You definitely want to leave about a foot in your container because as the grapes ferment, they're going to rise. Now I said at the very beginning, we're going to make wine the old fashioned traditional way. So we're not going to get technical and talk about measuring acid levels and getting into all kinds of detail. We're going to keep it relatively simple. Uh, so, however, what I would like to say, and someone's going to write in and say, you need to use sulfites. I understand that. And most wineries use a ton of sulfites. I folks don't use any. So this wine is very organic. Okay. I don't add any chemicals. I don't add any sulfites. However, if you want to add sulfites, again, I do not, but if you do, this is the time to add it right now. When your grapes are fermenting or before they're before they're fermenting you want to add uh, potassium metabasulfite a half a teaspoon per uh, case of grapes which will give you about a hundred parts per million uh, again if you want to do it you go ahead 
I am not doing that today. It's going to be 100% organic. No sulfites used at all. In fact, I'm not going to use any clarifying agents. Nothing. What you see is what you're going to get. Pure wine. So now that we know we're not adding any sulfites, you have an option. You can either add yeast at this point or do not add yeast. So my friend with his two barrels, he is not adding yeast. So what will happen, folks, is there is natural wild yeast in the air and it's going to ferment with the wild yeast in his case. In my case, I like more of a controlled fermentation, so I like to add my own yeast. Again, yeast is a natural product. So the yeast I like to use, and yes, folks, yeast makes a big difference. This is my favorite brand here, this FX10. It's a, it's a great yeast. I love what it does to the wine. And um, you can pick the yeast that you like by all means. Once you find one that you like, stick with it. And I have some a little bit of water here. I have two cups of water. And to that, I am going to add my yeast. So folks, I said I wasn't going to get technical, but just for the fun of it, some of you might be wondering, what's the level of sugar content? How much alcohol uh, are we going to get from these grapes? So let's just with the screen here, I'm going to scoop out some of this grape juice. Let's just pour it out into here. Look at that beautiful grape juice, folks. Again, we're just having fun with this. I normally do not do this, to be very honest with you, because I use California grapes, and California grapes are always, as a general rule, high in sugar. The higher the sugar content, the higher the alcohol content is going to be. So I have a hydrometer here, and this measures what's called balling or bricks, both the same level, and it also measure, which measures the amount of alcohol. So you just drop it in, it's going to float, because of the sugar level in there. Give it a spin so there's nothing clinging to it. And then you can take your reading. So if I look at it here, the BRICS is at 21, 22, 23. The BRICS is at 23, or the balling is 23, which is about 13.5% alcohol. This is going to be a perfect, perfect wine at least as far as the alcohol content goes so just a little bit a bit of fun with the hydrometer again you don't need to do this i did it just for fun okay so now that we've had some fun it's time to add our yeast and i've got my calculation here which i have calculated uh, i have here let me look at my notes here i have 77 grams of yeast that i measured out right here and what i figured out folks is you want to have 0 0.073 grams of yeast per pound. Yes, I know it's grams and pounds, but that's the easiest way I could calculate it. So 0 0.073 grams of yeast per pound of grapes. I bought 25 cases of grapes at 42 pounds each. That's 1,050 pounds. So that's what I have here in this container. I know it's a lot of grapes. Uh, so I have 77 grams of yeast that I'm going to add to some warm water. I have here with me two cups of warm water. So basically, I'm just going to blend that in. Now again, for my friend's wine, he's not doing any of this. He's just going even more natural, I guess, because he's just using the wild yeast that's in the air. So I want to make sure I mix this in, get it blended in, and I'm going to add this to our grape, what I'm going to call grape must, which is basically our crushed grapes. Okay, now i got most of that, and I'm going to make sure I spatula it all in there. So I'm going to add some just throughout. I'm going to work my way around this container and just add, add yeast, throughout. It doesn't have to be completely dissolved. Don't worry about it. So what's going to happen in my case, folks, because you're probably wondering, well, there's not, you mentioned natural yeast. Yes. So what happens is when you add yeast, it actually takes over the wild yeast. So the wild yeast succumbs to the, to the, uh, to the yeast that you've added. All right. So I might even want to rinse that a bit with some Get some more. 
that juice out here. Get all that yeast, there we go, into our bat, our vat. Okay, there we go. That process is now done. Okay, and there we go. I put my sheet over top and I like to put a bungee cord around the container. Again, this is just to keep the flies out and to allow the fermentation gases to escape. And I know this cloth looks dirty. It's 100% clean. It just came out of the laundry a day ago. It's just stained like crazy because I've used it for like 40 years and it's still kicking. So uh, mind you, it's not gonna touch the grapes anyhow. But what I do wanna mention also is this is in my garage. So you don't wanna necessarily do this in your house because it's gonna release fermentation gas and you don't necessarily want that in the house. But in the garage is fine. You open the door and you can aerate your garage, no problem. Um, so that's why I've chosen the garage. Having said that, my garage is also insulated. The ideal temperature for fermenting your grapes, again, you don't want to get technical, um, but if you can somehow keep your temperature between 70 and 85 degrees, that's ideal. If you go down to 65, that's fine. But if you start to get too cold, it slows the fermentation down. Uh, and if you get too hot, like if you hit 90 degrees, that's too hot, you gotta cool things down a bit. So look for that range between 70 and 85, even 65 is, is perfectly fine, and you'll get a good fermentation. Speaking of which, we're gonna let this sit, and I'm gonna walk you through step by step. We're gonna check out the fermentation process as it happens, as each day progresses. Oh, and one more thing I should have mentioned before we started putting the grapes into our vat, or in this container, the drums, you want your containers sitting on an elevated position. As you notice, these drums are on a, on a bench and then there's also some wood here to make it even higher. And my great big vat is also sitting on blocks and then some wood to get it up nice and high. And the reason you want that height is because when it comes time, folks, to remove the juice from these containers, we will be able to siphon it, which the term we use is rack it. We'll be able to rack it and use gravity to our advantage and make sure we get all the juice out of our containers. So here we are, it's day two. Uh, we actually started this process on Tuesday, which was day one. Wednesday was yesterday, I checked up on the grapes and there was nothing happening because you gotta remember the grapes were cold. So now, today is Thursday, which is day two, and let's take a look and see how our grapes are doing. And I can already see that they have started to rise and already start to develop a bit of a cap because the fermentation has begun. And I can hear just a little bit of crackling, so it's not really fermenting strong. But if you take a look at the container here, you could see how much room there is. Um, and if you re can recall, when we put the grapes in, it was lower. So the fermentation gas is pushing those grapes up. So now what we want to do is I'm going to take this nice little tool my uncle made for me. <laughs> you can see it's well stained. What you want to do is just break the cap. All right, there you see me doing that. It's got a little bit of pressure and I push down. And what you're doing here is you're pushing and you can see the beautiful juice. All the juice is below and you want to mix these all up again and we need to do this now now that fermentation has begun we need to break the cap and push the grapes down twice a day so i like to do it in the morning and then in the evening and if i see a little stem like that i just remove it okay remember we had these de-stemmed and the reason you want them de-stemmed is because the stems give off a bitter taste it taints your wine so it's always best to de-stem. And you recall, all we did was add yeast. On my friends, we didn't add any yeast. He's got the wild yeast, and we'll go take a peek a look at his too. But um, the sulfites, folks, I did not add any sulfites. I mentioned that earlier. Sulfites actually, um, that's one of the things that causes headaches for people are all the sulfites in the red wine. It's one of the reasons why people get headaches. When they drink my wine, 
they never get headaches because there's no sulfites. But the reason, folks, that the, the wineries add sulfites and a lot of home winemakers add sulfites is because it helps kill bacteria. But I always start off very clean and they keep things clean. And honestly, folks, I've never ever had a problem. But I guess if you're a wine, a winery, you can't take any chances, right? So that's why they add sulfites and they add a lot of sulfites to make sure they don't have any issues going forward. So you can see here now those beautiful juices and the color has already started to get darker. Every day now, folks, that I leave this, leave these, uh, leave the juice with the skins, every day I leave it with the skins, it's gonna get darker and darker. So, there we go, that's done. Perfect. Now, I will cover it again, and let's just go take a peek at the wild yeast that my friend is using to make his grapes. Okay, so let's take a look at my friend's wine, or his grape juice, his must, and I can see the same thing is happening, and actually I hear some little bit of fizzing, so it's also started, and you see it's made a bit of a cap here, so fermentation has started, but again, it's not really, really strong. When the fermentation is strong, the cap is all the way up, and it's much harder to even push down because you're pushing down on all those gases. But I'm gonna do the same thing here for my friend. Twice a day, we're gonna punch this down. And again, this is day two. This is Thursday. We started Tuesday, Wednesday, nothing was happening. And here we are on Thursday, we've got some fermentation happening. So I'm gonna just break the cap, mix all those crushed grapes with the juice, and let it continue to ferment. Tomorrow morning, I'll break the cap again. So here we are, it's day three, and I wanna show you something. We've got a good fermentation going, and if you take a look at my container here, because it's clear, those ones are dark, I want you to come in here and take a look. You see how it's kind of white and speckly here? And then all of a sudden from here, from here down to here, it's all dark. Well, what that is, folks, that's the juice. Okay, and this is the cap. So what happens is as the grapes ferment, it pushes all the grapes up to the top, the fermentation gas does, and then down below is all the free running juice. So what we could do right now, if we want to, we could take all this out and we'll have a medium dark red wine. But as I mentioned earlier, I'm gonna let mine stay at least for a week. I want that dark, dark wine. So what'll happen is this is gonna to continue to ferment strong. It might even get stronger tomorrow and come even higher. You can see how high it is from the top. Tomorrow it might even be a little higher. And eventually what happens is like this. The yeast, it starts to ferment, ferment strong, and then the fermentation starts to drop and it starts to get weaker and weaker. And that's because what it's doing, it's converting all the sugar into alcohol. So as it ferments, it converts the sugar to alcohol and it starts to slow down when the sugar is getting all consumed. So uh, at this point, what I'm gonna do, because we're gonna let it go a week, I'm gonna break the cap and I'm gonna actually take my mic out and we'll, maybe we'll do it in my friends. You might be able to hear it better. You could hear the, the fermentation going as it's fizzing away there. I'll let you see if you could uh, have a listen to that. So right now, let's go over and break a cap. So let's just see if by chance, I'm gonna drop my lapel mic in here. See if you can listen to this. Now, I don't know if you could hear that crackling or not, but as my father used to say, um, they used to call it uh, vina stabuli. It means the wine is boiling. That's how they used to call fermentation. But let's break this cap. Okay, so I'm gonna break the cap and you can see how dry it is up top. And his will be the same below, folks. He's got the cap on top and all the free running juice down below. And what I like to mention before I break this, as the fermentation starts to slow, on the last day, I will not break the cap because I want that cap to be in place and I want that free running juice down below so that I can rack it out, siphon it out, put a hose in and take all that free running juice um, out and then then what's left will be this these grapes and then that's what we're gonna press so as you can see we got a real nice cap here and 
This is this basically going to be the same as mine, but you remember he's got wild yeast. And again, see that cap? See how it's relatively strong? And you can see all the juices below. Okay, you can see here's the cap right there. You see that? That's the cap. And the thing with the wild yeast, if I didn't mention it earlier, is that you never know what you're going to get year to year. Every year is different. So your results for your yeast are going to be different. Another reason why I like to use uh, the yeast that I use, that I control it that way, I know exactly the yeast I'm going to get year in and year out. But again, having said that, folks, there's nothing wrong with using wild yeast. And besides all that, it's free. <laughs> okay, so you see the difference there now? We got, that's what we got right now. But tomorrow, when we come back here tomorrow, there'll be a nice cap and we're going to break the cap and you'll see we'll go through this all over again. So you can see how far down we are from this ridge. If you can see the ridge, we're down about, oh, I don't know, six inches. And we'll see tomorrow what will happen is the cap will come up and it'll be sitting there and then we'll break it again. But right now I've got to break the other cap and I've got to go over to mine and break the cap. Actually, before I, I leave folks, let's just, now that I broke the cap, you could probably hear the fermentation process a little bit better. Let me put it down the microphone again and have a listen. And there you have it. That's the fermentation. That's the fermentation uh, that's happening right now. And it's relatively strong. And like I say, it's going to continue strong until it starts to get low in sugar. Then it's going to slow down the fermentation and the cap is not going to rise as high. And that's when we're going to remove our juice. So here we are on day four and I thought we'd film in the morning so that I could try to show you again the difference. You could see all these white spots. This is all the cap. This is the grapes. These are the grapes here. And then here is kind of a line. And as you can, I hope you can see below, it's all dark. And this folks is where all the juice is. So I just wanted to show you that separation of the skins and the juice. So hopefully you're able to see that separation a little bit better now that I've got some daylight. Uh, but before I break the cap here, as I mentioned, it's Saturday, day four. And you can see we have a strong, a strong cap. There's a lot of pressure. There's a lot of fermentation. And as I mentioned, we're going to let this ferment, or I'm going to let it ferment, for up to a week, as long as the fermentation remains strong. Once the fermentation slows, that's what I'm going to rack it. Now, two things. What's happening is all the sugar is being converted into alcohol that's how you have a dry wine when it stops the fermentation it's converted all the sugar into alcohol and now you've got a dry wine so if you want a sweet wine then yes you can add some sweeteners and some stabilizers and make a sweet wine we're not doing that today we're making dry wine and that's why the wine is dry because it ferments all the sugar gets rid of all the sugar and converts all the sugar to alcohol and thus the sweetness is gone okay now the other thing I wanted to mention I said we don't want to get really technical and get into different things but what I do just want to explain to you do you remember when we did let me push this down look at this folks do you remember when we took that sugar reading and we had a reading and it was like 23 bricks which means about 13 and a half percent alcohol um, What's happening now, as it's now day four and we've had some fermentation, and I mentioned I'm going to wait until the fermentation slows, well, I'm just going by, by eye, right? I'm just going by eye to make that decision. But you can make it technically, right? And again, I don't want to get technical, but just because I want to let you know you could take this same juice that we took earlier, and I forgot my funnel. So I'm just gonna show you the difference, okay, folks? That's all, just to show you. I, I don't normally do this, okay? Like I say, I just, go by, I just go by eye or by ear as far as when fermentation starts to slow because the cap, the cap doesn't get as high and not as strong, and it gives me an idea when I have to rack. And again, racking is the word for siphon. Siphon, racking is siphoning. Okay, so if you recall, 
We had a specific gravity reading of about 23 when I put my um, specific gravity reader in my hydrometer. So I'm going to drop it in, give it a spin, and we are now at level. We are at basically sitting at 20 or 19. So our level ha has gone down. That's because the sugars, some of the sugars have been converted into alcohol over the last uh, four days. So that's why when we take this reading, it's dropped down to, yeah, it's sitting at about 20, almost 19 and a half. That's where it's sitting at. So what'll happen is as each day goes on, that sugar level is going to drop and it's going to go from 19 and a half to 15 to 10 to 5 and eventually to zero. So if I wanted to, I can keep an eye on it that way and figure out when I got to rack my wine. But I'm just going to let it continue to ferment until the, uh, until the fermentation slows. And that's when we're going to rack. So I just wanted to explain that to you. That's what's happening as the sugar converts to alcohol. So anyhow, day four, Saturday. And again, uh, it's Saturday morning, so I'm going to break the cap. And then I'm going to do it again tonight. As I mentioned, twice a day, folks. And look at this beautiful juice. We're getting good color off those skins. We're getting all the tannins. And, and that's where you're getting your benefit from the wine, right? When, when you're getting the, all those tannins and all the benefit from the skins, the color, beautiful. Look at that. Isn't that nice? So you could see there... That's a loose level, and that right there is the firm level. See that cap? Look at that thickness. See how thick that is? Yeah, beautiful. I love it. Okay, so I'm going to keep doing this, and then we'll do it again tonight. And we'll fire up the camera tomorrow, and we'll show you what we've got tomorrow, and we'll get into day five. So here we are, folks. It is Sunday, which is day five. So day five, and time to push down our cap again. And you can see we still have a strong fermentation going. Look how high the cap is. As you can see, it actually you can see as high as it came. It's come that high. So it's really risen very, very nicely. So again, same process, folks. Look at the pressure. There we go. Okay, so we're going to just break the cap. And again, we're going to do this twice again today. And I'm also going to do my friends as well, uh, which, by the way, his name is Dino. And Dino's going to come tomorrow because tomorrow, folks, exciting day, we're going to actually rack his wine and press the skins. So I'm going to show you the next process, whereas for mine, I'm going to let it sit an extra day. But uh, he wants to do his tomorrow. You see, I find the odd stem. That crusher destemmer isn't always 100%, but it's, it's pretty good. Not as good as doing it by hand, obviously. But uh, yeah, so tomorrow's going to be a very, very exciting day. We're going to go to the next process, and I'll show you how it's done. So here we are, exciting day, folks. It's now Monday, day six, and here's Dino's wine. As you can see there, the cap is really, really nice. So we've got all that free running juice down below and we're going to remove that juice right now. So this is the apparatus we're going to be using. It's a hose and it's taped onto a wooden pole. And at the bottom here of the hose, we've left about, uh, up, about a, an inch just off the bottom. And there's a little mesh screen here just to prevent if there is any skins or anything down below there from clogging up our hose. Um, but that's going to be what we're going to use right now. So let's get it in and get started. So you remember now, as we said, there's a cap here and below is all that free running juice. So we're going to slowly put this, poke it through the cap. Okay. And now we have to fill this hose with juice and try to avoid getting air. So I like to get up a little bit higher and then just start um, sucking on the end of the hose and getting that juice to come up. Now 
There we go. Now, as you noticed, I always stayed higher than where the, the juice was, and that way there's little to no air in there. And now, check this out. We got a little screen there just in case there's any anything that comes up like little seeds and whatnot but look at that beautiful color already isn't that nice so i like to put it through a screen and it goes into a completely clean pail uh, this pail is used only once a year for this purpose and from here we're going to put it in the dummy john so let's get this pail filled look at that beautiful flow folks absolutely beautiful nice pressure and that's why remember we put this up a little higher that's the reason why we want that uh, pressure to come down and the other thing some drums have a hole in the side and a little spout that you could just open the spout this one doesn't have it so that's why we're using this method and of course you could also use an electric pump but you know what let's pour this in the damage on let me stop this now okay I'm gonna move this over to the next pail and let's go over to the damage on Okay, so this is called a Damajan, and they're typically 50 to 52 liters, typically 52 liters. So what we're gonna do is take this beautiful juice, look at this juice, folks, and we're gonna start pouring it into our Damajan. And basically, we're not gonna fill the Damajan, but we're gonna fill it close to 7 eighths full. Uh, we're gonna leave some room because there uh, most likely is still a little bit of fermentation going on, and we don't want it to overflow in our dummy jam. So, the first little bit is in, and I'll show you where we're gonna, we're gonna fill it. So, here's the top right here. We're not gonna fill it up to the top. We're gonna probably fill it down to about here. And that way it has some room for fermentation and it's not gonna overflow. So we'll probably fill it to about, yeah, here or here, that level right there. So as once this gets to the level I mentioned, I'll show you what we're gonna do with this damage on. All right, let's get that in. Oh, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful color. Like I say, the longer you leave it with the skins, the darker the color is. And that is a beautiful, beautiful color of red. So once we get it to this level, what I'm gonna do, folks, is we're gonna take this cork this rubber cork and it's got a, a hole in the middle and this is an airlock that you just put inside that hole and once we get to the level we're gonna put that cork rubber cork in there nice and tight take that lid off and I'm gonna put some water or treated water treated meaning a metabasulfite water but you could use straight water and I know uh, Dino actually uses uh, uses alcohol but uh, I like to use just a metabasulfite water solution, uh, but again, straight water will do. And you put the water in up to the level that it's marked on the plastic water lock, put the cap back on, and then that's it. This now is going to sit for six to eight weeks, and then we're going to rack it out of here because there's going to be some heavy deposits on the bottom that we want to remove. So it's gonna sit with the airlock on for six to eight weeks with that water in the airlock to prevent. So what this does is it prevents the gases from coming out. So if it's still fermenting, the, the fermentation gas will be allowed to release, but no air gets in. Air, folks, is the number one enemy of the wine at this stage. When you drink the wine, yes, you wanna aerate it, swirl it, get that air in there, release those uh, aromas. But when you're making wine, when it gets into the container, that's why you have an airlock. You want no more air and you wanna limit the amount of space, air space that you have so there's less air contact with your wine. So please remember, air is the number one enemy of wine. So I mentioned we're gonna fill it to this level. However, after a few days, We'll be able to see if it if it's still if it's still fermenting and if it is you'll see your little airlock going pop 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 uh, but if it's not then what i'll do is i'll take some wine and i will fill it to about within an inch or two inches of the cork top it up nicely and let it set for the six to eight weeks so that's what we're going to do right now so we're going to continue doing this with all the dummy johns we're going to do both those drums um mine i'm going to do tomorrow but the process is the same. So we're gonna do both those drums and when we're done removing the juice from the barrels, 
we're going to press the grapes and I'll show you how to do that. Now remember how I said the cap is still nice and strong and we got all that free running juice. A little story, last year we waited a little too long and what happened was the fermentation slowed so much that it didn't have enough pressure to keep the cap up and what happened is the cap fell and we weren't able to get this all this beautiful free running juice out. Um, and if that happens to you folks, it's not a problem. You just take all that juice and must, put it in your wine press, and you're still gonna get all the juice out. It's just so much easier with that cap in place. All right, so we're gonna finish this, and then we're going to squeeze some grapes and get some more juice. So I just wanna show you the water level here, as you can see. We now, we filled this container to here, and now we're going to uh, remove the grapes and press the skins. Okay, so here we go. Look at that. Okay, all those grape skins, they are, there's a lot of juice, it's a lot of wine still to come from these grape skins, folks. And this is a handy, I use my, my, one of my kitchen pots with a handle. So here, let me dig down below, you'll see here, these ones are even more juicier. If I grab down below, look at all the juice still in here, folks. Look at it. See what I mean? So we're going to get all that juice. And we're going to press these skins. Look at it. So those were the grapes down below. The ones above, of course, are drier, right? So if I grab from the, the ones above, you can see here, they're not as rich and pulpy, but there's still a lot of juice in there. Okay, let's make our way over to the press. Okay, so now I've got the old trusty old wine press here, ready to go. We've got a screen and a pail there to catch the juice. That's our first dump. So I'm gonna go get more skins and we're gonna keep putting it in here and I'll show you how we, uh, how we layer this to get the rest of our juice. Okay, so you can see our grapes are in there. Time to put the cap in. So we're gonna cap it like this. This piece goes in second. Okay, there's our cap. I just level that out and then I start with blocks building this up because we got all this space here. If we had lots of grapes, I wouldn't have much space, but we have only six cases of grapes and you could probably hear the juice is still running. And you put these, you don't want them to touch the pole, of course, you leave a little bit of space and you don't want it to touch the cage either. So you just keep building. As as I'm putting this weight on, you could probably hear the wine trickling into the pail just with the weight. We haven't even started pressing yet. Just a little more wood and a little more wood. I might need more wood, but we'll see how that does. Okay, let's get this started. This goes down, this comes off. All right, our little pin. And we're gonna start pushing, pressing our grape juice. But if you take a look, you can see how much juice is coming out already. Look at that, folks. Look how much juice is coming out just from the weight of the wood that I put on top. Just by the weight alone, I haven't even started pressing yet. So once I start pressing, you're gonna see how much more we're gonna get. Okay. All right. Press. Now, oops. That's what happens when you go too fast. And pin in. All right. So as I tighten this, the grapes are getting pressed and you're going to see more juice come out. When you see a lot of juice coming out, slow down a bit, okay, because this pail is getting full already, we're going to have to switch. But as the juice comes out, just pause, let that juice run out, and then you, we're going to, we'll crank some more. Okay, so it's slowing down now, so I'm going to press a little more, put a little more pressure on those skins, and get more juice coming out. So there you go, look at that stream, okay, it's coming out pretty nice, you get a good stream and then stop and pause for a second and let that stream run out before you press again.
Okay, so it's slowed down again. Time to press some more. And as you see, I'm just doing it by hand, but it's going to get harder and harder, and that's where this pole comes in. <laughs> Put the pole in. Now it's so much easier to press. And we're going to continue to do this until it's so hard we can't press anymore. And that way we know we've gotten all the juice from those skins. So we keep pressing until there's a decent flow, but it's still going relatively easy. So I'm going to keep pressing until it gets hard. And I got a good flow there. So much easier with this pull. Okay, and now it's starting to get now it's starting to get a little bit tougher. And there. 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 So what I'm going to do, I'm going to stop right there. And then what will happen is that'll settle a little bit. That'll slow down and then I'll be able to tighten a little bit more. Okay, it's slowed down and you'll see now. See how easy it is? Because it's settled a little bit, so now I can crank it up some more and get it good and tight. Keep going until it gets all the way tight, which is right about there. Go get a little more. One more. Okay, so now, same thing. We're going to let it rest. You see, I got a good flow going. And I'm going to continue to do this until it's so hard I can't do it anymore. And then that's it. We're done with this batch. Everything comes out. The grapes, the, they get uh, composted. Uh, and that'll be it for that. I get this washed up and that's done. Now I just want to point out, you see I put some straps here. This is a really old press. And if you have the problem when you're pressing the grapes and the grapes and the skin start coming out these slats, that's what these straps are for. I just tighten it up. They're ratchet straps. I tighten it up and as you can see, there's no grapes coming out, even though there's a lot of pressure on this press, on those grapes, there's no grapes coming out of the slots because I have these straps there. Now, if you have a new press, you chances are you won't have that problem, but this is an old one, so I should bring it to your attention because if you have that problem, these ratchet straps work great. So that's the process. We're going to get this done and cleaned up. You saw the Demijohn. The Demijohn is 7 eighths full. So all I'm going to do is that's going to get topped up within a week up to the cork and then it's going to sit there for like I say six to eight weeks. So we're going to check back in in six to eight weeks and I'll show you how we rack this and the next step from there. Actually just before I sign off look at this it's going to pop. There you go see that? Yeah. That's the fermentation gas is escaping and you can see the, the uh, airlock see that? The airlock is doing its job. Hopefully you can make that out on camera because it is popping and releasing the gases. There you go. Okay, so one more thing. I thought I'd show you what we're left with. I, we finished pressing. We got our juice, our remaining juice. And this is what's left right there. You can see we've got like a pancake there <laughs> of grape skins that basically, like I said, we're gonna put to compost. Uh, because now, some people will make grappa, but it's not legal for us to do that. So we just uh, compost the grape skins. So here we are, six to eight months later. It's the month of November, and it's time to do our first racking. So what happens, folks? Racking is basically siphoning. We're going to take the wine from one Dumijan and put it into another Dumijan. So the reason for that is there's, uh, we want to remove the heavy deposits off the bottom. You can see in this clear demi at the bottom here, you can see that there is some sediment there. So what we're going to do with the first racking, we're going to rack it and it's going to clarify as we do that because we're going to leave the heavy deposits on the bottom. So to do that, I've got, I've got a hard, hard plastic tube here and then of course a soft plastic tube. But we're not just going to put this tube in the dummy john that way because with the suction power, it's going to actually suck up the sediment. We don't want that. So what we have here is a little cap. Is that a little cap right there? So this little cap, folks, just goes on the bottom of our tube, just like that. So now, instead of sucking from the bottom with this cap being there, it's actually sucking from the top and pulling it up and through. So that way we avoid uh, grabbing the sediment off the bottom. So simple device, but works great. 
All right, so as you can see, I've got a few to do here. So I'm gonna start with this one right here. Just remove the airlock from that one. Okay, and then I'm gonna very gently just put this tube into the Demijohn. Right to the bottom, there we go. Now, again, to get this um, racking, to get the suction going, you wanna keep the air out of the funnel. So I like to keep the tube up high as I start to bring the wine up through it. There, as you can see, we've got a nice solid red line. There's no air in there. It's just gonna make it easier for the racking. So in it goes. All right, now we just let it do its thing. So that's the beauty of this. Now, here's the thing, folks. When I do this, there's going to be some sediment left on the bottom. I'm going to lose a little bit of volume of wine. So this isn't going to fill all the way. It's going to fill to maybe here. And that's no problem because when I go to rack my next Demijohn, I will top it up with using a little bit of that from that Demijohn. And then I will continue into the next Demijohn. So I will continue that process until I'm finished. And these will be the last ones that I do right here. Now, let's just say you don't have all this wine that you're making, or maybe you do. But regardless, let's just say we just had the one Demijohn and we had nothing else because we didn't have any other excess wine. All we had was just one container. So if we all we have is a one, it's only gonna fill to here. And Air is the number one enemy for wine as you're making it. So we have to get the volume from here up to here. I have a solution for that. My own little idea, marbles. Yes, folks, marbles. So what I do, when I go through my racking process, because I have a number of Demijohns, I'm usually left with a container like this or a gallon container. Uh, whatever my smallest denomination is and if this container is only full up to here i add the marbles and i actually bring the level up to where it needs to be the beauty with the marbles folks is it's glass you're not tainting the flavor or changing the wine in any way but yet you're raising the volume level to where it needs to be so that there's no air or very little air in your uh, container so that's a little tip um, if you see some marbles, get them because I use them all the time, typically on my last container. So I'm going to rack this through and I'm going to continue with all my Demijohns until I'm done. So here we are in November and when I'm finished, I'm going to top it up and I'm going to put the airlock right back on again. Okay. So in fact, I always leave the airlocks on. It's a safety thing. If there's a little bit of pressure, um, I don't want the cork to pop and lose my wine. So I always, always just keep the airlocks on until I'm ready to bottle. So speaking of bottling, let's talk about this now. I'll move this over here. Let's talk about this now. So this is the first racking. Generally speaking, you're making your wine in September, typically, sometimes October, but September-ish, you're making wine. November-ish, you're making the first racking. After the first racking, what, you want to wait until about February, March for the second racking. You want to wait about four months for the second racking. So basically what I'm doing here today, I'm going to do again in March. Okay, same process, exact same process, but I'm going to do it again in March. And uh, from there, I'm going to let it sit. Now here's the thing, folks. You can let, let it sit as long as you possibly can up to two years so if you're making wine again next year and you need that demijohn then that means you're going to have to bottle so make it in september rack it in november rack it again in march let it sit until august and then in august you can bottle and free up that demijohn for making wine the following year if you have an extra Demijohn and you don't have to do it, then quite simply just let it sit until the following year and then bottle it. The longer it sits in bulk, the better it is. 
and the clearer the wine is going to be. Because again, we're not using any chemicals or anything for clarifying. It's going to clarify just through this racking process. And all we're doing, folks, are two rackings. Rack in November, rack in March, bottle in August. And, and the wine will be clear. There'll be very little sediment, if any. And again, not using any chemicals at all. So we're going to let this finish. I'm going to continue this process. You now know the whole process up until bottling. And I happen to have a Damigian from last year that is ready to bottle. So I'm going to finish this process here. Once I've got them all done, rather than waiting for August, I will bottle and show you the bottling process on the Damigian that I have. And we'll do that right next. Also, after your second racking in March, and you're going to let this sit all summer, keep an eye on two things. One, your level inside your airlock. Make sure that this level is always topped up. It might evaporate a bit. You don't want it to come down. And secondly, what happens is with the change in weather and the change in seasons, the volume of your wine could start to rise. And if you're not careful, it'll rise right up through the airlock and out and spill over and then you're gonna ruin your wine. So if, if you notice that your level is going up and you're starting to get concerned, just remove the airlock, take a little bit of wine out so it goes back down again and it allows for that little bit of fluctuation uh, due to temperature and season, seasonal changes. So folks, just before we begin our bottling, I do wanna mention one thing. You know how I mentioned when you rack it, there's a little bit of deposit on the bottom. There'll also be a little bit of uh, wine mixed in there. Do not throw that away. Pour that out gently into a gallon or another container and use it for wine vinegar, folks. Makes great wine vinegar. And to make wine vinegar, very easy. One to one ratio. If you have a half a gallon of wine, you add a half a gallon of white vinegar. Let it sit for a year. You got yourself a good wine vinegar. Okay, again. Nothing goes to waste. So bottling, I'm gonna show you two techniques. The technique that I did for many, many years and the technique that I'm doing now. So the technique I did for many years. So we're gonna bottle this Damajan, as I mentioned, it's from last year. It's from September of 2022. So it's been sitting nicely and we're gonna bottle this one today. Um, same thing, we've got, in this case, instead of a hard plastic, we have a metal, doesn't matter. Um, and again, you see here on the bottom, we are not going to grab the, we're not going to suck the wine right from the bottom. We put this little cap on there. So we suck it from the top and again, keeps our wine nice and clear. So that's the first thing. Then from the hose at this end of the hose to aid in the bottling process, there's a little device here. It's hard plastic. It's very simple. It's what I use for years. And at the end here, there's a little it might be hard for you to see, kind of dark, but it's a little, let's call it a stop valve. So what happens is you put this into your bottle, okay? And when you let it hit the bottom, that valve opens up and the, the bottle starts to fill. And then eventually when it gets to the top, you just lift it up and with that valve going in the down position, it stops automatically, it stops filling, you go to the next bottle, you fill it. So these are very inexpensive, they work great. It's a little time consuming, but I did it this way for many, many, many years. Okay, having said that, in comes my good friend Sam, and he gives me a gift of a bottler. So this now is automated, I plug it in, it's uh, very, very simple to use. I'm going to show you how, how we do that today. And again, I'm going to use the same device. So let's remove this airlock. Same thing. We're going to put that in gently to the bottom. Okay. Now, instead of adding any device, this has to hook up to our bottler. Oh, let me move this out of the way. I don't want to drop that. So let me just get that in there. It's a tight fit, which is good. You want a tight fit. Okay, there we go. All right, so that's now set. I've got it plugged in. And basically, 
the way this works, which I'm going to show you, you put the bottle underneath and it'll start to fill and it'll stop when it gets close to the corking. Um, it'll stop automatically, but I will remove it. And I'm using a clear bottle here to show you the filling process. And I want to talk just a second about bottles. Clear bottle, dark bottles. I have lots of dark bottles, dark to keep the light penetration away from the wine. But honestly, folks, in my wine room here, it's always dark. The lights are out, the room's never open, so it's always dark. So really, whether you use a dark glass or light glass, doesn't really matter in that case. If it's exposed to light, then of course you want a darker bottle. All right, so now that we've talked about the bottling process, I'm gonna show you this process. And of course, yes, we're gonna do the taste test like we always do, folks. Okay, let's fire it up. There we go, we're starting to fill nicely. And yes, I also reuse bottles. Why not? Any bottles that you have, friends give them to you, save them and reuse them. So that's gonna fill up. All right, let's remove that. There we go. Next one goes in, same process. So this now is ready for corking. I'm gonna show you how we do that as well. But let me stop this. Let's stop that right now. We'll just give it a stop. Okay, because I do want to taste it. Oh, it's got a real nice color. Beautiful color. Take a look at that, nice dark. And the reason it's so dark, again, because we let it sit on the skins for a week. Aerate it just a bit. Mmm. Because it's been cooped up there for over a year, so you want to aerate it a little bit. At this time, the aerating is perfectly fine. You want to decant and aerate, let those aromas out. But during the winemaking, air is the number one enemy. Cheers. Beautiful wine, nice and dry, full, full bodied. Oh my goodness, that is amazing wine. Ooh, 2022 is a good year. Okay. Corks and bottling, or corks and corking. Seriously, folks, this wine is unbelievable. I'm going to say better than any store bought in wine. You know why? It tastes good, and there are no additives in this wine 100% natural doesn't taste like homemade wine at all okay so corks first of all in case you don't know cork comes from cork oak tree um, I happen to get these in Portugal and you could see that's the bark here of the tree and there's the cork part right there so there used to be a shortage. This is a bigger one. You can see the cork on the inside there, right? And the bark on the outside. There used to be a shortage of cork, uh, but not anymore. There's lots of cork. In fact, they use cork to make all kinds of things from purses to hats, etc. Okay, now, as far as corks go, I want to show you a couple different corks. So this one right here is solid cork. This one is what they call a conglomerate. So this one here is about half the price of this here. So there's, there are also synthetic corks if you want. You could use a synthetic cork. cork. Um, they're also more expensive, but I like to use the natural cork. Now, having said that, the conglomerate is much less expensive, about half the price than the solid cork. So you have conglomerate, you have solid cork, then you have synthetic cork as far as prices go. So I've, um, I've uh, migrated to the conglomerate because it's a better price and it does just as good of a job. The difference is this is solid cork. This is also solid cork. However, it's made from a bunch of little bits of cork. So when they have all their leftover cork, they grind it up and they make these what they call conglomerates. So they work just as well. That's what I'm going to use today. All right. So we got our bottle of wine that we so easily and quickly filled, thanks to our machine. This is our corker. Now, there are two models of corkers. This is a floor model. Um, there's also a countertop model. Personally, I prefer the floor model. I find it easier 
to, uh, to bottle, but both systems work very, very well. This also has some holes in the bottom. You can secure it to the floor. I don't feel you have to, it's heavy enough. And I like to be able to move it around. The countertop has the same thing with the holes. You can fasten it to a countertop and, and do your bottling. So basically we're gonna put the cork in the hole here and it's going to squish the cork and this lever is going to push the cork down into the bottle so it compresses the cork pushes it in so for this i will stand up the bottle goes in it's, it's kind of held there tightly with a spring cork goes in compression push done bottled there you have it simple and you can see there's not much airspace in there that's perfect for aging now once you have it corked Ideally, let the bottle sit in the vertical position for two, anywhere from two to five days. The reason is you want the cork now, because it's been compressed, you want it to relax a little bit and open up. And then when you put it on its side, it'll create a good seal. The cork will stay moistened and retain that seal so you could age it then horizontally. But like I say, initially, just let it sit for two days, up to five days, up to a week, and then you can put it horizontal. That's for storage. Okay, so that now, folks, completes the process. I do want to add one thing because you probably see the barrel back here and you might be wondering. Okay, so if you want to barrel age, that's fine too. Um, make sure you have enough wine to fill it and it should always stay full when you empty it you should refill it right away that way um, it always stays full and the uh, the barrel um, keeps its seal nicely so it doesn't uh, doesn't start to shrivel up and dry up and leak so <laughs> basically so this is corked uh, i do have of course uh, a, a barrel on the go and if you want to do a barrel you fill it but just remember this once a month remove the cork and because you lose wine every month you lose wine in fact i'm going to show you uh, because it's it's november now it's time for me to top it up again and every month what i have to do with my barrel wine is top it up so here is my homemade wine again i just reuse a bottle um and let's let's top that up uh you know what let's do that right now but if you do want to use a barrel what what i did made it in September, racked it in November, racked it again in March, and that racking, it went right in here. And then it sits for another year in here before I bottle it. That's my own process, but of course you could do what you wish. All right, let's just top this up. So let me show you. Oh, take that cork off. All right, and there, as you can see, here's our wine right here. Yes, I save at least 12 bottles, I usually save 20 just to be safe, of the exact same wine. So I'm adding the exact same wine that I made that's in the barrel is being added to the barrel. And you can see here how much it's taken already. I'm gonna bring it right up. Normally it takes the whole bottle. This time, maybe not. And, oh, maybe yes, it's still, well, we're getting there. And that's a take. Uh, maybe just a tad more. Okay, there we go. It's nice and topped up. Seal that back up again. And that took, basically it took the bottle. There's that much left. I mean, you're talking... <laughs> You're talking one sip of wine. So one bottle a month, folks, that's what it takes. But it's worth it because, as I mentioned, the bigger in bulk that you store your wine, the better the flavor. So, But having said that, the Dumajons are perfectly, perfectly fine. Now, after bottling, I like to let them sit at least to the one-year mark. So if I started in September... The following, let's say October, it's been a good 12 months, time to crack open the wine. If you could wait an extra year and let it sit for two years, even better. Two year homemade wine, 
fantastic. And in fact, why not save some wine and age it? Let some stay three years, four years, five years. Uh, you may say, Evo, you haven't used any sulfites. Your wine's going to go bad. I've had wine up to 20 years still be good. So with zero sulfites. So um, no problems there. Having said that, the other thing you could do is you could have a little fun. You can buy these, these little plastic, you know, little plastic caps, right? And what they do is they basically, they go over your wine. So if you want to get fancy, a little nicer, put it over your wine. And then with a, a heat gun, I don't know if you got a real hot hair dryer, it might work as well. And with a heat gun though, you just touch it and it just, and it seals up nicely and it makes for a better presentation. In fact, speaking of aging wine, this is my oldest bottle. I don't know if you could read the label there or not, but this one here is my Ruby Cabernet and it goes back to 1999. And as you can see, I put a, one of those plastic uh, caps on the bottle again just for a show and I keep that tucked away here in my little aging now I did drink that wine when it was 20 years old and it was fantastic that's my last bottle and I thought I'm just gonna let it sit until I'm 65 years old um, which is three years from now and then I'll crack it open on, on my 65th birthday hopefully it'll still be good but if not that's okay too it's only one bottle it didn't do me any harm Okay, just a little bit more. Alrighty. Well, you know what, folks? I really hope you've enjoyed this episode as much as I've enjoyed bringing it to you. You know, making wine from home is not really a lot of work. A little bit of work in stages, but not a lot of work overall. And at the end of the day, you're able to enjoy a glass of wine that you've made with pride by yourself in your own home. Why not give it a try? if you haven't done it yet. It's a great hobby, hobby. And yes, folks, we are keeping the tradition going, keeping the tradition alive. Why not give it a try? And if you do, please drop me a line. I'd love to hear from you. Or if you're already a winemaker, if you've picked up a tip or two, that would make me happy too in this episode. Either way, I'd love to hear from you. Thanks for joining me on today's episode of Cooking with the Koyas. No cooking done, but a lot of making going on. And until next time, bon appetito, salute. Oh, so good. Really, really is good.